Hello again everyone. So our last video we implemented the beginning of a hash table data structure and what we encountered was the problem of a hash collision. And what do we want to do about that? Because we, you know, even if a hash collision occurs, uh, which is when two values map to the same index or hash to the same value, we still want to put both of those different values in the hash table and be able to search for them later. So how do we deal with something like that? All right, so first, formal definition. A hash collision occurs when different values hash to the same hash value. So we apply the hash function to something, say two integers, say five and 25, but they hash to the same value. That's a hash collision. Now there are such things as perfect hash functions that map each value, remember from the big, great big, potentially infinite space, to a unique hash value. And many of the cryptographic algorithms for hashing, they're close to perfect. We're pretty sure and there's no perfect hash functions, but uh, it's a conceptual thing that we should be aware of, right? But hash collisions in general are going to occur, right? So um, one way to get around them is to have better hash functions. So for example, the modulo hash function isn't so great. Uh, you get a lot of hash collisions with it. The mid squares a little is quite a bit better in terms of that, um, just because of the mathematical properties of the way that numbers are distributed. Um, so, you know, the first step to dealing with hash collisions is to avoid them in the first place. Um, you can do that in two ways. One, use a good hash function. Two, uh, make the table bigger. If there's more slots for you to hash down into, uh, the less likely you'll have a hash collision as well. All right, so there's kind of two, two aspects to this problem. But if you get a hash collision, what are you going to do? You still want to put those values in the hash table somewhere. Well, there are two strategies for dealing with hash collisions. One, the first, is called open addressing. And open addressing means find the next empty slot using some search strategy. The second strategy is called chaining. And that's basically where instead of having a hash table with slots um, and you put a value in each slot, instead, each slot is actually a list of values. And so We'll take a look at both of these, All right? So open addressing here. Um, imagine, you know, you've got this nice hash table. It's pretty small. It's only got 20 slots. Um, and we've got some values in there. Uh, open addressing says, find the next empty slot, All right? And there are two strategies here. And we'll look at an example of how these work, right? The first is called linear probing. Okay. so you hash two things for the same value. Linear probing is just a fancy way of saying, go to the next slot and see if it's empty. If so, put the item there. If that next slot isn't empty, go to the next one. Go to the next one. Just keep going up the array until you find an empty slot. That's all linear probing is. Um, the problem is it's susceptible to what we call clustering where if you have a lot of things that hash to the same value, say this table has 20 um, imagine, slots, imagine if you insert 20, uh, 40, 60, 80, they're all gonna hash to zero and you'll get them all kind of clustered together. And then your hash table, if you're looking for a value, uh, you're basically just searching a list and that's not good. A slightly better approach for open addressing is what's called quadratic probing, where instead of just going to the next slot, we take bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger hops down the uh, array until we find an open slot. But let's have a look, right? Let's see what these look like in practice. Okay, so um, I've got my hash table here. It's got 20 empty slots. Uh, let me move myself, whoops, excuse me. Let me move myself down here to the bottom so you can see all the slots. All right, so let's just illustrate what linear probing looks like. Let me put some simple values in here. Um, let's hash in, uh, let's hash, whoops, 22, and we'll just use the modulo method, OK? 
Okay, that'll be our hash function because it's the simplest method. So if we hash 22, that's going to go here, right? Now let's hash uh, just the value 2, right? If we hash the value 2 using the modulo method, it's going to hash, well, first 22 goes to slot 2. If we hash 2, that also goes to slot 2. Well, the linear probing method says, all right, there's already somebody here in slot 2 when I go to insert 2. Um, just increment by 1 until you find an empty slot, right? So if I try to insert 2 here, nope, it's full. So just go up to 3. Is 3 empty? Yes, it is. So let's put a 2 in there. That's where the 2 goes, okay? Um, not too sophisticated. Let's put, um, let's put say, 7 in there. Well, 7 using the modulo hash function just goes here. Uh, let's put in a more interesting value like 55. Where is 55 going to go? Uh, using the modulo method, that should hash to slot 15. So that'll go here. Okay. So we're starting to fill up the table a little bit. Uh, let's hash something we know is going to collide. Let's hash 27. Okay. Now where's 27 going to go? Okay. Well, compute the hash. 27 mod 20 is 7. So it's going to go wants to go into slot 7, but it cannot because there's already something there. Whoops. Uh, sorry about that. Tablet's a little bit sensitive to uh, where I lay my hand. I'm still getting the hang of it. I apologize for that. And how to move things around. <laughs> find my mouse here. Let's see. Not sure why it thinks I want to be here. There we go. Hopefully this is a little better. Sorry about that. Um, so it wants to hash 27 to this slot, right? But it's occupied. So where does it go? It goes to the next slot, which is number 8. Okay, so 27 would go here, right? So 27, it hashes the 7, but it actually winds up in slot 8. Just like when we hashed 2, uh, 2 wanted to go into slot 2, but it actually wound up in slot 3. Okay, let's do one more here. Let's hash uh, 82. Okay, 82 mod 20 is going to give us 4 with a remainder of 2. So 2 is the slot it wants to go to. So once again, we're up here. We want to go into slot 2. There's no room at the end. So it goes up 1. Linear probe. It goes up 1. Is that slot free? Nope, afraid not. So it goes up one more slot. Slot four. Slot four open? Why, well, yes it is. Okay, so when I hash 82, it winds up in slot number four. Okay, so that's linear probing. Um, but the problem with linear probing is you tend to get groups or clusters, right? You tend to get clusters of things. And these clusters aren't good. Why is that? Well, because if you try and insert, say, 62, where is 62 going to go? It's going to start here at 2, and then go to 3, and then 4, and then 5, right? So we, we're starting to walk down this array, and that's not good, right? The benefit of the hash table is it's big O of 1 search time. If we have to walk down the array to find an open slot, or if we're looking for the value 82, and we call our get method, well, we come here to 2 and we say it's not there. Well, maybe I should look in the next slot because maybe a collision occurred. Let me go to the next slot. Is it in slot 3? No. Well, maybe I should go to the next slot. Is it in slot 4? Oh, there it is. Okay. So when you have a linear probing, you start to have to walk this list, and that's not so good. All right, this is clustering. A slightly better approach is what we call quadratic probing. Okay, It's kind of the same premise, except we're going to do bigger and bigger hops every time to kind of spread the data out through the hash table. Right. So let's put these same values back in. Um, let's hash 22. 
And again, we'll use the modulo method. So once again, 22 is going to resolve to 2 right off the bat. Okay. So, um, quadratic probing. Hash gets hash plus i squared until you find an open slot. Okay. So, let's hash 2. Okay. Where is it going to go? Well, initially, it wants to go to 2 again. My pen does not like me. Nor does my tablet. Initially, it wants to go to 2 again. Okay. All right, but 2 is occupied, so where does it go? It goes to hash plus i squared. Okay, so what's the i? i is going to be the number of times that you rehash the thing. So initially, i is going to be 1, right? Initially, i is 1. So hash plus i, hash plus 1, is going to be 3. So we only jump to here to begin with. Okay, not a big improvement. They're still side by side. But now let's go back and let's insert number 82. Okay, where does 82 go? Well, by using our mod function, it initially wants to hash to slot 2. Okay, it's not full, uh, can't go there because 22 is there. So it's going to try the next spot, i equals 1. I equals 1 is going to be slot 3. Is there somebody there? Uh, yes, there is. Value 2 is there. All right. So now I equals 2. We're going to look for the next thing. Hash plus I squared. Right? I squared, 2 squared is 4. So we're going to go to slot number. Hash here is going to be the initial hash value, which is 2. So this is going to be uh, 2 plus 2 squared, which equals 6. Just like slot 3 was 2 plus 1 squared equals 3, right? So this is going to jump from here all the way up to here, slot 6. Ah, now there is space. So I'm going to put 82 in right here. Okay. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. Uh, let's do, let's move uh, my head again. Okay. Let's do one more. Let's do H of, who's going to go to slot 2? Um, 42 would, right? So when we hash 42, we get 2. Right? All right, 2 is occupied. We know that. So let's apply our quadratic probe. So the first iteration, i equals 1. So 2 plus i squared, 2 plus 1 squared is 3. Is 3 open? Nope, the value 2 lives there. Go to the next iteration, i equals 2. Hash value plus i squared equals 6. Is 6 open? Nope, afraid not. All right, we go again, i equals three. Okay, hash value plus i squared. Three squared is nine, nine plus two is 11. Okay. 11. All right, is 11 open? Yes, it is. So that's where we're gonna put it, okay? So this is the concept of quadratic probing. Um, and as you can kind of see, just with even these values, it starts to spread things out and prevent them from clustering when they hash to the same value. And that's a good thing, right? So, um, linear probing, quadratic probing, let me go back to the slides here. Uh, one more strategy that we want to look at, or we'll just talk about briefly. So, both linear probing and quadratic programming are strategies known as open addressing find the next open slot in the hash table using some uh, algorithm. The other option is called chaining. Okay, Chaining says uh, inst instead of having just one value in every slot in the hash table, put a list in every slot of the hash table. 
And that way, whenever there's a collision, just add it on to the end of the list. It's there at that slot. Um, this is not a bad idea. It's actually pretty simple from an implementation standpoint. The downside is you can wind up wasting a lot of space. Um, because, you know, it, as you remember from talking about array lists, um, you have to uh, jump, you know, each array that you allocate takes a chunk of memory. So if you have arrays at every slot, you're potentially occupying a whole bunch of memory. Um, and then also searching these things is, you kind of lose the power of searching a little bit if you do so as well. So chaining, we're going to stay away from. We're going to stick to an open addressing scheme. Right? Now there's one more concept that you need to be aware of that has a huge bearing on how well your hash table performs in terms of its search, right? Because our goal is to keep everything big O of one. Right? The last thing that matters here that we'll talk about is called the load factor. Right? So what's the load factor? The more hashes you have in your hash table, the more likely that a collision will occur, right? The less free space, the less open spaces there are, um, the more likely you're gonna run into something already occupying space. So uh, when it's the ratio of how many slots are filled up in the hash table to uh, the number total number of slots is what is called the load factor, right? So for example, in this list, uh, there is, or excuse me, in this hash table, there's 20 slots and there are 16 items. So the load factor, which is denoted by the Greek letter lambda, is 16 divided by 20, which is 0.8 or 80%, right? So this hash table is 80% full. Um, so it's a good idea to keep this load factor below a certain threshold to avoid collisions. Um, so how do you keep it below a certain threshold? That what that means is that once you when you insert stuff into the hash table, what you want to do is you want to check this load factor and say, hey, have you gotten above a certain threshold like 66% or 75%? And if so, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grow my hash table. I'm going to allocate some more space, a bigger chunk of memory, and I'm going to put everything back in the hash table. Um, kind of start start fresh and spread everything out again. Um, kind of like Python's array does. Once it gets full, if you remember Python's array, once it gets full, it goes and finds a bigger chunk of memory and copies the array over into it so you can keep adding on to the list. Well, we're going to do a similar thing with a hash table. Once it gets too full, we're going to allocate bigger room for it and reinsert everything into the hash table. Okay, so these are all the critical hash table concepts you got to know. Hashing, hash values, uh, slots, collisions, how collisions can be resolved through open addressing um, and linear probing or quadratic probing, and then the load factor. Right? So to wrap up hash tables, we're going to go back to the code and we're going to implement some collision resolution and then at least talk about a strategy for dealing with dynamically resizing the hash table in response to a uh, too high of a load factor. We'll do that next time.